Hey, big hello to everybody out there in the BCOM family. I hope you are all doing well. And we are entering chapter four of our time together in the business communication book. And so we're about at the quarter point, uh, the fourth of the way through the book, fourth of the way through the term and the class. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, when are we actually going to start writing stuff and doing communication like that? And we're getting there. In fact, our video today, we're going to talk about that writing process and a few expert writing techniques that you can incorporate that will immediately make you a better communicator. And so I'm really excited to share those with you today and we'll jump right into it. Hopefully get uh, something out of our video today. And we're gonna talk about the three by three writing process. And that's a process that our book talks about. Uh, most every business communication book will have a similar three by three you know, process that they go through. So we'll walk you through that today. And we're also gonna talk about, like I mentioned, the expert writing techniques. Very simple things that you can do and incorporate into your day-to-day -day communications to immediately make you a better communicator. Some of them aren't so much uh, grammatical tips as they're just kind of a state of mind and things to think of when you're communicating. So I like those, you know, uh, sometimes the grammar can get a little bit tedious as we're trying to uh, make sure we're using that good grammar that we've learned in our English classes. Uh, so these are things that you can do that aren't really grammar related. Yeah, so we'll talk about those today. But before we get into that, just a, a thought on communicating and, and communication in general. Your book gives you a definition of communication, and they define it as the transmission of information and meaning from a sender to a receiver, from one person to another or multiple people. And that's absolutely right. And we think about that communication process, you know, and I know that it doesn't always go smoothly, does it? Uh, things can pop up, things can happen that can derail that communication process. And if we look at the little icon or the graphic the book has given us, uh, that process is mapped out as a five-step process. Beginning when the sender has an idea and they decide to take that idea and encode it into the form of a message, you know, uh, whether it be a email message, a text message, a face-to-face -face conversation, a phone call, that kind of comes in step three, where they decide how to transmit and channel that message. And then from that point, it's up to the person receiving it, how they decode it, and then what kind of feedback they give to the sender. So I just wanted to emphasize that part of it. When we think about communication breakdowns, there's kind of a wall, and your book doesn't really talk about this, but I kind of made a little black line there. As a sender, we control what happens in one, two, and three. Then there's a wall. We have to take that communication over the wall. Once it goes over that little wall, it's up to the person decoding it how they're going to respond to it. So when we communicate, again, whether it's a face-to-face, -face, a phone call, whether it's an email, a written document, we need to think about the things that we can control in step one, two, and three. How we craft our ideas and refine them, how we pick our words and how we deliver that message. All that's in our uh, area of control. And we need to control what we can control in a communication setting. Because once it's out there, we lose control of it. Once it goes over that wall or through that wall, we can't control how someone else is going to take our message, how the recipient is going to act, or if they even act at all. Uh, we can't control those things. So what we do is we control what we can on our end, being cognitive and thinking of how the other party is going to respond to it. So we're trying to think a step ahead. How are people going to respond to our communication? And we try to create our communications in a way that they're going to get the responses we want, okay? So in doing that, we have to understand our audience. We have to know who they are and how they're going to respond to what we're saying. We have to create messages and communications in a way that they're going to be received in the manner that we want and they're going to be responded to in the manner that we want. And it kind of sounds manipulative, but it isn't really. It's just thinking ahead. In fact, I include that in my communication golden rules here. We have to understand communication is a two-way street. If I don't consider the other party and I'm having a one-way conversation, that really doesn't benefit anyone. 
So we have to know our audience and we have to understand them and what their needs are. We have to anticipate how our audience is going to react to our communication and we have to tailor our communication to get the response we want from our audience. And we have to adapt to our audience, okay? And so a lot of times when we communicate, we're just thinking of ourselves, you know? And, and that's really not the mindset we wanna have. Uh, and we're gonna have to think about the people we're communicating with and the best way to get our message across to them by looking at it from their point of view. So we're kind of flipping the coin here. And the rules that I, the golden rules there apply across all the channels of communication, you know, uh, verbal, phone call, uh, video chat, uh, email message, you know, text message, any of that. The, the rules apply. And I'm going to give you a really good example here from the registrar at the college, uh, Miss Amanda Thompson. Uh, Amanda was wanting to send out an email message and remind the faculty that they needed to post attendance on all their classes. It's a very important thing. Faculty has to post attendance because it has an impact on financial aid. So here's her message. All. You can see she sent it to a whole bunch of people here. 143 plus individuals. This is a friendly reminder that attendance needs to be recorded within my records by 5 p.m. on Friday. I will be pulling the attendance data after the deadline. We'll be dropping students who never attended. If you posted last week, or if you allowed a student in after you posted, please double check. If you have any questions, please let me know. So Amanda knows faculty are busy. You know, I get a ton of emails every day that I've got to sort through. I don't have time to read uh, a great big introduction, you know, that kind of thing. So she gets right to the point. Faculty, you need to post your attendance. She also understands that there are going to be people who get that message that maybe they don't know how to post the attendance. Instead of writing an email and putting that in the body and making the email extremely long, notice that she attached a document that walks a person through how to do the attendance. And then finally, she ends with a nice little uh, closing there. If you have questions, please let me know. That's kind of anticipating and welcoming people to bring those follow-up questions to her. Sounds like such a simple thing, just a simple email. But there's an art to it. There's an art to getting your point across quickly. There's an art to getting your point across efficiently and friendly. And we talked about that in the one discussion board. Remember, can we still be friendly on email uh, and still be professional? And she kind of did that here. Didn't take any emojis. She didn't put a bunch of exclamation points in there. But still, friendly reminder, please do this for me. Very nice email. You think, what kind of a weirdo is my BCom professor? He sits around critiquing emails and, and rating them like a movie critic. I do. I do. Communication is important, especially now in this environment where a lot of our communications are happening online through email and text messages. Uh, the first impression that you make with some people is going to be how you communicate with them electronically. And do you want that impression to be, uh, you know, gosh, this person can't even put a sentence together, can't form out a, a document or a message? No, you don't want that to be your first impression at all. So business versus academic writing. When Amanda sent that email, she had a, a very specific purpose that she was trying to achieve. She was trying to get faculty to post their attendance or to contact her if they didn't know how, if they had questions. Very specific purpose in that email. And that's pretty common in business. We don't write just for the sake of writing. We don't communicate just for the sake of communicating. We're trying to get something done, aren't we? So in that trying to get something done, efficiency is very important. We're not wanting to waste our time. We're not wanting to waste the time of the person that we're communicating with. Time is money. We're trying to be efficient in our communications. And our communications are audience focused. The email that Amanda sent, she didn't spend a lot of time focusing on her needs. She said, this is why we need to do it. But she was focused on the audience. Here's how you can do it. Here's when you need to have it done by. If you need help, contact me. Focusing on my needs as opposed to hers. That's good business writing. And good business writing is completely different than how we're taught to write in our English classes. In academia, the ivory tower of academia, you know, it's completely different. Think about your academic writing when you go into Comp 101 or Comp 102 and you're, you're told to write a paper. Well, 
a lot of times you're told, well, think up a topic. You know, we, you know, or maybe you're given a general area and told to explore somewhere in that area, but you're given some leeway. Think up a topic. In English and academic writing, quantity is important, isn't it? How many times have you heard a, a, an English teacher say, I want you to write a paper, uh, four pages, 20,000 words, you know, what that kind of thing. Quantity matters in English. And our writing in English is rubric focused. Am I checking off all the boxes that I need to check off? Do I have my thesis statement? Do I have my supporting points? Do I have the big words that they want to see in there? You know, it's completely different. So one of the challenges that we have in writing for business is we have to get out of that academic mindset. We still need good grammar. I'm not saying we have to throw away grammar and the usage conventions and punctuation and, and that kind of thing and spelling. No, no, no. But we have to shift our mindset from trying to sound big and flowery in our language to being efficient, getting our point across while still being friendly and conversational. Okay? So hopefully you can make that transition. I don't think you're going to have too much of a problem. Usually we have a harder problem making the transition to writing those big, long research papers in English class, don't we? So we're all about the business writing here. And to kind of sum that idea up, we can go to our good friend, Kevin Malone. If uh, those of you that uh, check out The Office, remember when Kevin decided that he was going to say few word, not waste time, many word? Kind of the same idea. Now, we don't want to have that bad grammar, but we're keeping that philosophy of trying to be as efficient as possible when we write and when we communicate, especially uh, in business. So here is the three by three writing process that we're looking at. And we'll kind of, we'll drill down a little bit deeper into all uh, these three areas as we move forward in class. But this week, we're going to be really kind of focusing on that pre-writing stage where we're thinking about what is our purpose in trying to send a message and what do we want the receiver to do and thinking about how to choose a channel that best gets our purpose achieved, whether it's face to face or electronically. We're going to think about the audience, anticipate their me uh, needs, and then we're going to adapt to meet their needs. And we're going to think about how we can get what we need to have done by anticipating what the receiver of our communication is going to do when they get it. Second part, we'll talk about actually drafting the communications, and then we'll talk about revising. Now, the amount of time we spend in any of these given three areas varies on the kind of message or communication that we're doing. A lot of people say the majority of your time in writing should be spent in pre-writing. If you spend your time in pre-writing and invest your time there, it cuts down on the amount of time you have to actually draft. A lot of us kind of build the boat as we go along, as we're floating along out there in the ocean. We're doing step number two and trying to piece it together as we go. It's an important investment in time to spend that time pre-writing and gathering those ideas and thinking about the audience before we get to step two. And that's one thing that uh, I, I learned as I started trying to uh, improve my writing abilities with spending more time thinking about what I was going to write instead of just jumping in trying to think it up as I went along makes for much more concise writing. So expert writing techniques, uh, little things that we can do to immediately improve our writing and the way we communicate. Okay, so not focusing on grammar here, though grammar is important. We'll look at that in other areas. But here are eight techniques that our book gives us that we can use to kind of sound conversational but professional and improve our writing and increase the likelihood that our writing is going to be accepted and acted upon by the intended audience. So here we go. Number one, we want to spotlight the benefit to our reader or to our audience. And it may surprise you to find this out, but people generally operate from a standpoint of W-I-I-F-M. Yeah, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Why do I care? What's in it for me? Okay. And it sounds selfish. That's the way the world works. People are generally self-interested. I do things that are in my best interest. So sometimes in communicating, we need to tell our audience, hey, this is why it's important for you. This is why you should care. And we craft our communications to tell that recipient 
what the benefits are. And it's important in doing so to kind of put yourself in the reader's position. Uh, this idea of empathy that's so big now with everything going on, we have to be empathetic with other people and what they're going through in these COVID times. So give me an example of that. Maybe one that doesn't quite show the empathy that it needs to show. Uh, this is an email from our, our COVID coordinator. I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here. I just want to show you uh, how empathy can be construed one way or the other in an email. Hello, everyone. I hope you've had a great week. Whether or not you're interested in the COVID-19 vaccine, this newsletter contains important information. It could have stopped right there. That's probably where that sentence should have stopped, but it continues. That you can use to think beyond yourself and help others, especially those who need assistance in navigating the process. Thank you. This is an opportunity to make a difference. So, empathy. There are a lot of people who are very hesitant to take a vaccine that has never been scientifically tested at a large scale, that no one knows the long-term effects of, and that there are a lot of reports that people are having some pretty bad side effects. And this is something that people are shooting into their bodies. So, uh, we need to be empathetic to people who feel that way. Whether you're pro-vaccine, maybe, you know, uh, I'm pro-vaccine, but even me, as a healthy person who works out every day and takes their vitamins, I'm a little bit weary of putting that into my body. I'm not going to lie. So we need to be empathetic to those people and not make them feel as if, well, if you don't think you want it, then you're selfish and you're not thinking beyond yourself, which is the connotation of what was put in there. And maybe that wasn't the intent. Okay, but when we put ourselves in a reader's standpoint, we can see that maybe that might not be the best way to phrase that because people are kind of defensive about maybe not wanting to take a vaccine. Okay, so by kind of beating them over the head, we're not accomplishing our goal of telling them, hey, open this up and get the information. That way, if somebody you know has a question, you can help them out. That was the main point. That was the main point of the email. But when we don't look at it from an empathy standpoint, we don't consider the audience, sometimes we write things that can come off the way that we don't intend them to come off, okay? Put yourself in the audience's shoes. Be empathetic to the way they read it and the way they're thinking. Kind of go along with that. Develop a you view. Focus on the you of the reader, not the I of the sender, okay? And you've probably met people in life all they want to talk about is I. And I can think of one person on Facebook in particular. I used to be on Facebook. I quit a couple years ago. But everything they posted, I this, I that. Somebody famous died. Oh, I can remember meeting them. Here's a picture of where I was with them. I am so sad that they, everything was I. Even good things that happened to other people. They would put it in the I. Everything was I. And when you write like that, you come across as a pompous jerk. <laughs> If it's continually I, 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 I. So focus on the you. Focus on the reader. I'm not saying you can't put I in your emails or your conversations or your communications. But when we do that, we want to use I to convey sincerity or enthusiasm, not just direct things and attention to ourself. Okay, so we got some examples here. You can see right here. I need your account number before I can do anything. That's an I focus statement. Are you focused? Would you mind giving me your account number so I can locate your records and help you solve the problem? Okay, kind of see how that works. So we, we kind of want to watch over using the eye. At the same time, a little bubble down here, we want to avoid finger pointing. You didn't do this. You forgot. You failed to. You, you, you. We can use you to point a finger. We don't want to do that either. Okay, uh, so... We want to have a you view, reader focus, don't over exaggerate the eyes. But at the same time, don't use you to point that finger. Don't want to put people on the defensive. Oh, that good discussion board where you all gave me so many uh, thoughts on how to incorporate personality into your messages uh, and not sound robotic, but at the same time, be professional and not over the top. We want to sound conversational and professional in our communications. So we're shooting for a middle ground here. The middle ground between I talk like a 13-year-old on the playground 
and the other side being I talk like a professor at Harvard that uses big words, okay? <laughs> We're trying to hit that middle ground between the two. And your book gives you some examples of, of words that we can use that would be conversational as compared to unprofessional or formal. You know, uh, rule of thumb here, if you have to look it up in the dictionary, it's probably too formal for an everyday communication setting. Save that for the English paper that we were talking about a little bit ago. Uh, on the other side of it, if we're using words like I'm ticked off or don't rat on me, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Maybe we're being a little bit too unprofessional in that low-level diction there. So here's some examples here, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, obviously, we don't want to use text lingo in our business communications. Great news, BTW, LOL, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, slang, look, dude, this is bogus. <laughs> you know, we don't want to have that kind of... Uh, wording pop up in our emails and written communications in business. And we can also be overly formal. Uh, you can really, really make things sound a lot more complicated than they need to be. All employees are herewith instructed to return the appropriately designated contract to the undersigned immediately. Oh, what the heck? Please return your contracts to me. You notice back to Amanda's message, you know, please post your attendance. She could have said something like, Effective 9 p.m. on Friday, all employees are hereby uh, demanded to have their attendance posted in the appropriate software program. You know, something crazy like that. She could have said that. No, she didn't. She said, please post your attendance. Simple. Get to the point. Be efficient. Nobody's impressed that you have a thesaurus and you can look up great big words. Number four. If I, if I were to put an asterisk and say, this is my number one tip for you. In your communications, this is it, gang. This is it right here. State things in the positive and not negative, okay? And what I mean by that is we need to focus on what is and what can be. And don't always focus on what isn't and what cannot be. So I'll give you some examples here. The negative, you failed to include your credit card number. I can't mail your order. That's negative, it's can't. You failed, you can't, we can't. Look at the positive. We look forward to completing your order as soon as we receive your credit card number. Wow, that completely changes that message, doesn't it? Employees cannot park in lot H until April 1. That's negative, they cannot. Employees may park in lot H beginning on April 1. That's a positive statement. And you think about, uh, sometimes think about coaching. You know, uh, my kiddo plays softball. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when, you know, when kiddos are learning to play baseball and softball, they're scared of the ball. And when they're standing there hitting, they'll want to step back and they'll step away from the ball. And that's not a good hitting stance to be in. And so you'll hear coaches say, don't step in the bucket. Don't put your back foot back there. Don't do that. Well, that just reinforces the bad habit. Stay in. Foot forward. You know, we, we, wanna, we don't want to put things in a negative. We'll put things in a positive. You know, keep your foot in. We don't say don't step back. We say keep your foot in. So it's the same. We like to use positive language and not negative language. And I'm going to take that one step further. You all know people who can find fault in everything. And that's all they talk about. Well, this is wrong. Well, that's wrong. Well, they didn't do this right. Or that should have been done differently. Blah, blah, blah. It takes zero talent to find fault in something or to find a problem in something, okay? Zero, any idiot out there can find a problem with anything, okay? And you, say, you think about like TV shows and, and you'll see people on social media, uh, they'll take a popular TV show or a popular movie and they'll just say something bad about it just to be saying something bad about it. And they'll try to make people feel bad for liking that show, okay? Th those people aren't special, and they're just jerks. And there are jerks out there who can find fault in every single thing. And they're going to tell you about that fault. In business, it's the exact same. And there's no value in that. There's no value in pointing out something that's obviously wrong and complaining about something that's obviously wrong. Where the value for you as a professional is going to be is finding solutions, creating and implementing solutions to things that are wrong. Okay? It's not enough to just say this is wrong and point it out. 
And, and to do that constantly and never come up with a solution to fix it? No. We don't want to be that person. We want to be positive. We want to look for solutions instead of being negative and always just complaining about things that are wrong. Okay? So take that mindset in your writing. Be positive, not negative. I'm not saying you can't ever point out uh, that there's an issue with something or something's wrong. But when you do that, I challenge you, combine it with something to fix it. We got a problem. Here's what I think ought to be done to fix it. Okay, don't just be the person that points out problems because you add zero value when you do that. Number five is probably pretty close to number four and, and that's express courtesy. Remember, our goals as a business communicator inform someone, persuade, to compel them to take an action, or to create goodwill and to create a relationship. Okay, that's our goal. If we're coming in guns blazing and you did this wrong and you better fix it or by gosh, we're all in trouble, you're not going to get a very positive response from that. So we have to be aware of our tone in a business communication. Okay, and sometimes it's hard to do because sometimes in business we can get angry. I think about situations where me as a consumer uh, have had a have had a problem with a product that I bought, maybe a vehicle or maybe an expensive electronic item that I bought, spent a lot of money on, and then it breaks, and I'm having trouble getting the the manufacturer to make it right. I get angry. I want to yell. I want to hit my desk, and I, I want people to make it right right away. And when they're not, ah, ah, I get so mad. But you have to remember. The people you're communicating with, they don't really care that uh, probably that your stuff is broke either way. And if you come in guns blazing, they're going to put the wall up and say, you know what, I'm not going to help you. And it's like my grandma used to say, you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. You have to be courteous even when you're angry. And you have to keep that courteous mindset throughout your communications with people. In the long run, it will benefit you. And I'm going to give you a pro tip right here. If you want to send a, an angry email, you're at work and maybe uh, somebody's made you mad and you sit down at your keyboard and you fire off that email and you're going to show them and you're going to make your point and they're going to take it, okay? If you're at that point, cool off, okay? Uh, I, a lot of times I can think back at any time in my life I've ever sent an email that was sarcastic that was written from an angry place. I don't want to say I've all, I'll always regret it. I've always regretted those emails. But I can tell you that not one single time did I get the result that I wanted to get. And not one time did it make things easier for myself and end up where I wanted to end up with that situation. So take a cooling off period. If you have to type it up, type it up your email, leave it in your drafts, and then go home, wait 24 hours, and then send it the next day. Okay, uh, that cooling off period... I mean, you text messages too. Um, it, it, it will really come in handy, keep you out of trouble. Number six, we like to use bias-free language. Uh, I have a trouble with this in the classroom sometimes. I, I state things in terms of male pronouns. Uh, you know, you guys uh, in the classroom, I might refer to the classroom full of people as you guys are going to do this, okay? Or I might be talking about a you know business person and I always referred to a man, okay, he or him, that kind of thing. So I'm trying to do better and use more gender, uh, gender neutral language. And we should be doing that in our writing as well. And you can see some examples right here. Uh, a gender bias might be the cleaning woman. Well, if it's not a woman, then the appropriate language would be a cleaner, okay? Uh, the doctor, the doctor, he, you know, if we don't know for sure the gender, then it's they. So we're just trying to use gender neutral uh, terminology there and that, apply that to also race and age and disabilities and that kind of thing. Number seven, people try to use big words, try to sound smart, try to sound like they're plugged into what's going on in business and they love to use jargon. They love to use those buzzwords and, you know, we want to change the paradigm, that kind of thing. So we like to use plain language. We like to avoid the jargon and the buzzwords and all that. And like I said before, if the average person has to look it up somewhere, it's probably not a good word to use in our communication. So commensurate 
we want to find uh, a salary commensurate with our experience level. Okay, or whatever. That's equal. You don't have to use the big word. Uh, we were wondering when the sales will materialize, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, stay away from the, the big fancy words. Try to find things that are more conversational in tone. And then finally, we, and I get on people about this all the time when we write papers, especially in my accounting classes, use precise words, okay? Specific is good. Vague is bad, especially when we're talking about financial stuff. And I'll give you an example. I say all the time, I'll say, uh, there was a big change in profits or the economy's doing really bad or income went up a lot. Well, those words don't mean anything, especially when you could give me exact data. So don't say net income went up a lot. You say profits went up 25%. Don't say the economy is bad. Say GDP dropped 15% during the quarter. Okay, any time in business we can substitute a specific for something vague, do it, do it. it. It makes everything so much more clear to the reader because I may have an idea of what a lot is and that idea of what a lot may be completely different than what your idea of a lot is. So we make ourselves more effective communicators by being specific as opposed to being vague. Another thing being big does, it makes people question uh, the accuracy of what you're saying. It, it takes away from your credibility a little bit. And maybe it's one of these things where, and they're pretty vague, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. Or even worse, they're pretty vague. I think they got something to hide. They're hiding something from me. You don't want to be in that position either. So, wrap it up. Eight great techniques to incorporate into your day-to-day -day writing, your business communications that will make your writing more effective. I got them all right there summarized. I'm not gonna read through them, but if you wanna kinda of keep that slide handy or keep that page in the book bookmarked, refer back to it, I think that's a great idea. That's chapter four and what we need to get out of it. Uh, questions or comments, reach out anytime. I'd be happy to hear from you. I got my email address right there. In chapter five, we'll continue on through that three by three writing process and we're gonna be writing those great business communications pretty soon. So hang in there. I'm looking forward to see what you all come up with when we get into the writing part and we'll see you back here for chapter five.